Hey, Sean, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sean Cruz. I'm based in Toronto, Canada, and have been a uh, senior sales leader for 25 years, doing all kinds of things in tech. Cool. How'd you get into sales? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking about this prior to uh, our conversation. I started as a uh, head box folder in a tiny little startup called Corel Corporation back in 1989. Did that for a couple of years and had the customer service people constantly coming down asking me about, you know, what package, what's this, the customer was missing a manual, because at that time, technology was sent in a big binder full of books and discs and things. And uh, eventually that, that, you know, that led me to start circumventing some of the customer service people and talking directly to you know, different customers and things. And eventually in a, uh, another small company called QNX Software, I started as a uh, telesales rep and kind of went from there. Yeah. And what you like about it? Uh, you know, I think, I, I think initially I, I liked the upgraded pay. That was something that was, kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a people person. I'm a, a classic A type. You know, my wife always says I'm I'm the guy that meets every, by the time we leave a party. I'm the guy that knows everybody's first name and history. So uh, I really enjoyed talking to people, and you know, I I never looked back. I uh, I, I went from telesales into inside sales and spent a couple of years there. And my my first big commission check that was it. It was over. Once yeah. that happened, I I never uh, I never spent another day wondering about what my career was meant to be. Yeah. And what were some of the things you first learned about sales that um, kind of helped you become really good at it? Or were you a natural? You know, I think uh, empathy. Yeah. You know, the, the, the ability to, you know, I, I was born and raised on a farm. You know, I live in a small town. My, 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 my parents and grandparents and community and other people are, were always concerned about others. So I think spending the time to kind of think and feel and and listen to others was was you know top priority in the context of just developing relationships with people, and that's really how how I got started was. But I, I would say empathy is number one. But I think the other thing that's important is that uh, you know I, I really I, I had an ability to really boil down complex. You know, technology at that time was so complex, and not every buyer, not every decision maker, kind of understood it. You know, I, I learned the hard way through manuals and books and other pieces. So I had an ability to communicate my own lessons to the, the clients who I think appreciated the fact that I wasn't, you know, because our developers used to be over there and they'd, if you engage with them in a conversation, it was so complex, you'd walk away more confused than ever. So being able to, being able to simplify things and, and be empathetic with customers, I think really, really got me started. And where'd that skill come from? Was it that you were just trying to learn it yourself? Were you a technical person? I had no technical background and, you know, I don't have the advantage of, you know, any type of computer science degrees or any of those types of things. So I, I think having to learn at a production level, so learning about which manuals go in what order, you know, how the disks are packaged, understanding like really, you know, almost janitor level basics of kind of what was going on and then, as I progressed in learning, I started to understand the implications of when those packages received, what the experience was in terms of the order of the customer going through that. So the, that ability to really know that part really set me apart from a lot of the you know, competitors in my inside sales teams along the way. Because I, you know, I had a really deep understanding. When somebody said they were missing manual four, I knew exactly what they meant. Yeah. And I knew exactly where it probably broke down and how it didn't happen and those types of things massive advantage and and you know over time now that i you know I, I lead a much larger organization i spend the time talking to the people that are doing these types of activities and actions within the company so i understand them i want to know how we invoice a customer so when somebody tells me you know i've had a problem i can go okay it's probably right here let's go there and start from there um, you know i think as leaders we often don't spend enough time really looking right down to the to the entry level resources that are supporting our ecosystem and understand their roles. Because when you do, and you can then map that through the organization, your ability to connect with customers and communicate with them and, and, and talk to them about 
business process and, and change and things and empathize, empathize with kind of their challenges in terms of dealing with you as an organization. It's just, it's such a competitive advantage. It's unbelievable. Well, I think so, because a lot of people talk in their language and expect the other person to try and figure it out instead of communication being our responsibility that they understand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of the mistakes I see make, organizations make. And, you know, if you, if you understand the, the customer buying journey and you've, you've worked in anything to do with digital marketing or any community around kind of current generation buying processes, you know, bringing your language into a customer environment sets you apart, but in a negative light. Negative Being able light. to communicate and understand and, and talk to a customer, you know, there's a lot of really good negotiation tactics and, and things that you can imply and apply that really change the way a customer leaves a conversation with you. And that's it, because with technical things, it's very easy just to stick with the acronyms and the tech speak, and it, it serves no purpose. I, I've wasted many a days and hours listening to technical blah, blah, that at the end of the conversation, people walk out of there and go, I just, I don't even know what we just did there. <laughs> you know, let's be honest with each other. You know, technology sales and enterprise sales, very often we don't do ourselves uh, a service. We, we, we spend so much time training and, 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 and using tactics and things that are built by us for us to be taken advantage of that we forget very often some of the basics. You know, listening, curiosity, asking lots of questions. You know, my, my best sales teams and people that I, that I know are relationship people and and very often they're not the best technical resource, and but they really understand and empathize with customers, listen, communicate. It's it, it's a, it's a frustrating thing when I see those things go on. Yeah, because a lot of people just get in their world and they don't start where the client is. You got to put yourself in their shoes to understand how they are viewing this, especially when you're selling something that's new and different. I think, you know, whether it's new and different, whether it's, you know, legacy or older, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we really need to know and accept that our, that our buyers are highly skilled. They've probably at this point dealt with 10 or 15 or 20 people just like us. They've seen the best and worst in us and their expectation of us is probably very low. So being able to, you know, being able to exceed. If you, you know, I, I, I spend time talking to my buyers and my clients. They, they really, you know, a quarter of the salespeople that deal with them, they really like. And, and, you know, the other remaining fall into various buckets of, you know, these guys are okay. I can deal with them. The, they, that group, I don't want to talk to ever. So, you know, we have a lot of opportunity to improve our profession, improve, improve our personas you know, leveraging technology and lots of cool new ideas and other things, but it's a, it's a challenge for us. Yeah. And, and do you think that farm, was it a working farm you grew up on? Uh, you know, it, it was country. So family members had a farm, you know, it, it, let, let's call it a country setting. I wouldn't say that I was necessarily the guy out milking cows and things like that. You know, my, my older brothers and my aunts and uncles and others, you know, had different jobs and different things, you know, these hands were not cut out for that type of stuff. And if you look, you can, there's a reason why I'm not back home, you know, with family or cousins and aunts and uncles, love them all to death. But you know, my path was, you know, my path was in sales and that was pretty early on. I think the, the thing that scared me into sales was my uh, stepfather buying me my first pair of work boots. And I was like, yeah, I don't think those are even going to touch my feet once. Yeah. So I, that, that I put on dress shoes and bolted. That's it. One summer, uh, a family friend, you know, called up, hey, you, you, any of your boys want to come work on the farm? And we were like, money? Awesome. And we were bailing hay. And we went with short pants. And boy, do you learn what real work is like. I, uh, I have no doubt that was a very difficult experience in shorts. Yeah, because, you know, for the first hour, I was like running from the truck to, to, ba to mount the hay. And the boss was like, you don't want to run. I go, why? I <laughs> because in about an hour, you won't going to be able to walk. Yeah, you won't be able to move. 
That, that particular job is one of the tougher ones in farming. Fortunately, we have technology that does it better, but back in the day, 40 pound or 60 pound bales of hay, there's a reason why you call them big farm muscles because they are like huge guns by the time you're done. Oh, once. that's it. And, and the, the twine that holds them together just starts to cut through your skin. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I know that feeling very well. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that work ethic and kind of avoiding that manual labor, which, you know, really wears you down towards intellectual labor. Well, you know, it, um, being willing, you know, the best leaders that I've ever worked for, the types of leaders that are willing to get into the trenches and, and participate in cold calling campaigns or reach out programs or, you know, in the event of, you know, uh, backlogs or other, they're really willing to get their, their arms and legs and elbows dirty in that. And I think it's a, uh, it's an important skill when you motivate teens. I always, I always, you know, one of my favorite movies is, uh, is We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson when he tells his general that I'm always boots down first and boots off the ground last with my team. And that, that statement always stuck with me because I think it's so important to motivate your teams for them to know when you're willing to, you know, go in and, and do their job if you have to or do, you know, anyone's type of work because at the end of the day that's you know getting the job done is is kind of priority one right it, it is and i think too many leaders today are trying to lead through a dashboard instead of talking with their reps yeah a dashboard and a stick you know we often forget the carrot and some of the other stuff right it's like <laughs> well you know uh, you know activity is part of work and monitoring and having it is good but once you start telling reps, that's how you judged. You just get the activity, not the result. The, uh, the, the danger with the analytics is you're spending all the time on the analytics and not enough time doing what's most important, which is out talking to customers, touching partners, hanging out with people. Because th this is a relationship business. And in, in enterprise selling, you know, anyone that tells you that this is about any, you know, number one is relationship. Right. And, and, and trust. That are, um, you know, the, there's, there's a, a ton of data on trust barometers and especially in this current environment right now, trust is the number one, number one decision criteria above price, above functional requirements, above other, but there's tons of data on trust being the number one selection criteria for customers in 2020. That takes time to build and, it, and it's every interaction, every experience to have with everybody around you. So it's yeah. important. And why did you decide to go into leadership? Um, you know, I had, I had an opportunity probably 15, 17 years ago to take my first crack at it. I, I, uh, uh, but I, I would tell you, I don't know that I made a decision to go into leadership. I would say that it just developed around me. Yeah. And you know, sometimes in, in rising, uh, I think the, the, uh, the teaching and the coaching, I've, I've got a lot of patience. I have four children. I've been through a divorce. I've, I've just got a ton of patience with a lot of different things with, you know, with, with my experience. So I, I think I developed into a leader rather than necessarily, there wasn't like I woke up one day and said, I want to be a, you know, head of sales and take all this stuff and be the middle choke and have everything rain down from the top and everything rain up from the bottom. That wasn't something that I just chose to do, but I, I grew into it and, uh, and in growing into it, you know, I, I think it probably makes me a better leader because it's not something that I necessarily chose to do. And, and it just enveloped me and developed around me. And I see that a lot that the people who act like leaders get pulled into leadership as opposed to those who are trying to solicit for it. Well, you, you can see when, when um, this is not always the case, I don't want to generalize, but you know, it's very obvious to me when I meet people people that, have, that are just natural born leaders and, and, and those that aspire to be like that. And there's a, there's a significant difference between the two. You know, real leaders, you know, I, I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I don't have to talk at all. You know, I don't need to make decisions and other, you know, I, I, uh, I tell my kids that my, my job is to make decisions only when someone else will not or only when sometimes you know, you, you see something that from an experience standpoint, you just know, I, I love to leave my team bump and knock around. I, you know, I don't know if you remember that little game rebound where you throw the marble up and it bounces off the side. I think often 
you know, it's really hard to step back and let people bounce off because your experience tells you, well, you're going to hit your head there and bump your elbow there. But without those lessons, the people don't get their own experience. And it's something I teach my children too. I let them bump around and there's been a few handfuls of big bruises and, and small, tiny, you know, teenager disasters as a result, but they're better for it. And I think people are better for it. You learn from experience. And that's it. A lot of us have to learn from our own mistakes. You know, I think it's just part of being human. And I also see a lot of great leaders having, you know, decent sized families, lots of kids, because that, <laughs> that's good training. But I think, you know, patience, you know, as a leader, patience, you know, and again, particularly at a VP of sales level, whether you're, you know, a frontline VP, second line or third line, the rain, as I said, is the rain is coming from the top and the rain is coming from the bottom and there's a tiny little chokehold in the middle, which is that job. Yeah. And I think patience, you know, there's a, uh, uh, being a hockey player, you, you know, anyone that's a sports fan, you know, when, when a defenseman or, or a forward to that matter carries the puck into the offensive zone, very often they stop and they allow, literally they come in really fast and you think they're going to rush the net, but then they stop inside the blue line and allow the play to develop around them. Yeah. That is patience because what you're doing is, you know, standing and watching a bunch of things go by and then making your decisions after they develop really tough in sales to do. Sometimes right. you got to give competition a little, you got to give them a little advantage to be able to see how they're going to debate you so that you can come in. You know, like there's a lot of strategy into that. And I, and I love that about sales. You know, that's one of the things that I just love about sales is the ability to just, you know, be patient and be intelligent and be strategic and, Attack when you attack when you are most likely to succeed. You know, versus a lot of salespeople that just you know run and gun right out of the gate and you yeah. lose deals because you brought everything to the table before you really needed to and before you had an opportunity to allow your competition to bring everything they had to the table and then come in behind. You know, it's a great strategy there. That's a that's a great analogy because typically people want to pounce. You know, that, that person's got the puck and they're going to the goalie as fast as they can. The goalie aligns with that person, but then somebody else comes right up who's got the, you know, the goals wide open on that side. Yep. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's something that I, I think a lot of sales leaders, you know, we, we, we tend to press our teams hardcore, do this, do that, do it now, get it done, give me this, give me that the other, which, which I think, you know, it's important because steps to close and, and process and, and next steps are really important. But I, I think the question you have to ask is, where's the customer in the context of what they're asking us for? And do we know if the competition's provided, provided it to them? And depending on those questions and answers, sometimes you want to give your information first if you're an advantage because you can seal things. And other times you want to hold back and deliver them at a later date. And there's no set formula here. And there's no, there's no book you can read that guides that. It's experience and, and knowledge that you have to really think about. And, uh, you know, timing is everything. Yeah, because I hear that from reps all the time. Oh, we got short sales cycles. It's like you have a short sales cycle when they're in market, when they want to buy something, when they're looking at you and somebody else, and they have an internal deadline. But a lot of stuff we sell, uh, there is no sales cycle. You know, you get one person within a company that wants it. But the company hasn't made a decision that they want to yeah. buy that kind of product. I think the, uh, you know, the statistics on the customer buying journey are pretty clear. 60, 65, 70, 58, like, you know, depending on the report that you look at through Gartner or other, you know, they're, let's be honest with each other. $20,000 spend at my level, I need, you know, 11 levels of approval. There's no such thing as he has signing authority arbitrarily for 250 or 500. And there's no, no leader that's going to sign for something like that without 11 levels of supporting people throughout the organization. So the idea that you have a short cycle, what, what, what you're really saying is we've only been engaged for this 45 day period. Because yeah. the amount of work that's gone into that, the budgeting process, the decision criteria, and, and I really don't find very often where a customer goes, oh, yeah, we just we decided on this on Monday and we're going to buy it next Friday. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't happen. Right. And, and but the rep wants it, so asking. they think it's going to happen. Exactly. That you, their you view of the world is the right questions. view. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's, 
It's a skill that separates the, the great sales reps from the mediocre ones. When a great sales rep will go, you know, this is what they told me, but I'm going to go back and ask where in the, when their budget cycle is and walk from there and, and see where they really are and, and figure out who is the decision makers and the curiosity there's a real lack of curiosity in our industry. And I find, you know, we hear something and we want to jump on it. We'll just take a step back and, and keep asking questions kill you, until you can't think of any more questions to ask. And, and then find two more and, and make sure you're really dug in. Yeah. Be, because we're blinded by our own need and we hear what we want to hear and we believe what we want to believe. And I think your point about the, the difference between an order taker is anybody can take an order. It takes a lot more to be a salesperson to make things happen. I did, uh, I did a deal review yesterday and I had three reps and another manager on the phone. A deal slipped five days, five days across the quarter. And, uh, you know, so I asked the question, so how did we know that, you know, how do we know that this was in the signing process? And everybody said, well, you know, we were supposed to have it Wednesday and we had no idea that the CIO didn't understand the deal structure. So on Friday, he asked a couple of questions and I was completely surprised by that. And I was like, really? So you were surprised that the director could sign off on a 500K deal and had to go to a CIO. Were you surprised or did you just have your happy ears on and not want to ask the question? Yeah. And, and literally, you know, there was the, when I said that there was the silence because we should have known and, and we should have knew. And, and ultimately I should have been asking more questions because I had my own happy ears on, which happens. But if I had, had asked the question, so who's the signer and do they know about this transaction? The answer would have been a director and I would have, I would have immediately called them out. So it was a couple levels below me. Um, but the reality is that's the kind of thing that I talk about in terms of curiosity and questions. And that's it because the deal tends to start over every time it goes up a level, right? Because they're like, well, why are we doing it? Why are we doing it now? Don't we have another solution? What are the options? Did you do your due diligence? And, and we tend to think that, oh, somebody with a CIO title has a million dollar sign off. And it's like, let's say even if they do, they're still gonna talk, they're gonna socialize it. It, uh, it, it is a reality. I, I think any spending over 100K goes to somebody in finance. So if you have, like, you have to go even if I have signing authority, I have to go and say, hey, by the way, I'm going to spend this money. Yeah. So, you know, if we don't talk about that interchange or that exchange, that's exactly what well, I didn't know that was going to happen. You're right, because we didn't ask. Yeah, because, you know, I had a VC on about a year ago. And I go, does anybody ever run a purchase by you as a board member? And he goes, they better. <laughs> you know, because, and, and they don't do it for approval. They do it for consensus. There's yes. a difference. Well, I think consensus and the other, the other part is, you know, you, you can get fired for a lot of the decisions you don't talk about, right? You, yeah. you, can, you can get relieved of responsibilities for a lot of those decisions that have not been, you know, shared with your leadership team or your ELT teams or above. It's a lot harder when you have consensus and, and everyone's agreed to it and approved it. It's a lot harder. So I think that's just reality. Reality is nobody makes a decision on their own anymore. It just doesn't happen. No, because if you're buying a car, you know, you might be a car expert, but you probably still talk to your other car expert friends. Yeah. D do you get this engine or this option or do you wait to the next model year in six months? It'll be better. You're not asking for their approval. You're asking for their opinion. You know, t tell me, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your, uh, your listeners, your followers, what what are they what are they most interested in hearing about sales sales leadership you know I'm I'm curious if, if you could say to me what would be you know something that they you know what would they want to know from you based on your experience what do you, what, what what would be something along that line well I, I think what I hear most often is we lose to no decision and what I try and stress is you got to understand how companies buy. And that no decision's the default. It's not the exception. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 we, we are so afraid, um, I think, as sales people, even as sales managers and leaders, we're, we're so afraid of a fast no. We're so afraid of a no decision that we fail to press that early on. And, you know, I'm a big fan. And, and I, you know, 
I think it's a fair question to ask at a management level between managers. And I think as salespeople, you know, we're afraid sometimes to get our managers on because sometimes they ask questions that make us feel uncomfortable because we don't like that. And, oh, he's going to cost me the deal or she will cost. You know, I think it's a really fair question. So look, you know, number one reason that we see these things not happen is no decision. So tell me about where you sit in the context of having this become a no decision. What is my risk if I'm going to invest $40,000 in resources with you? And I think that's a really fair question. And I think if you ask it in fairness, uh, you know, and I think we, we, we shy away from that, we hide from it. And I think as sales leaders and sales reps, you should be asking that question once every couple of weeks. And, and, and you know, what you're looking for is the crack because the worst thing that you can do is get to the end and have a no decision, have a no decision occur at the very last moment when you forecast a transaction, that actually is something that's, you can foresee that and you can forecast that and you can keep those deals out of forecast. You know, it's nothing wrong with extending something in pipeline, but let's have those tough conversations early and just keep it back, keep it in your realistic or your pipeline and develop it, but don't bring it into four. That's the worst in my opinion is when you get something in a forecast and then they're like, well, it was a no decision. Ooh, that hurts. Right, because when you get certainly above six figures, you're getting into no man's land at some times. And the, the things that can go wrong are just, you can't count them. No. You know, I, I've had, I had a huge deal that I kept off of the quarterly forecast. I put it in the, I put it in the, in the next quarter for half as much. And I didn't, we got it the last week of the quarter and my boss was like, you were sandbagging me. And I go, well, if I put it in this quarter and it slipped a week, whose fault would it be? <laughs> he goes, yours. <laughs> so I always tell people, people love a surprise and hate a disappointment. You know, it, it, let me ask you a question about that. You know, I, I, in managing my deal line and in managing my overall pipe and my forecast and other, I actually, I'm okay with reps sandbagging. But what I ask is to share with me kind of where you think these might be. You know, it's part of the, tr it's part of the trust factor that you need to develop with your, with your teams. Do you think that you kind of withheld that because you had a trust challenge with that leader? Well, it, well, the, the problem, what I used to say is that the sky would darken with planes from home office. Right. <laughs> and, and then, but are they planes full of people that can help? Sometimes. And I've had the, the situation where they are, you know, planes full of people that can help. Yeah. You know, my best rep was the CEO of the company one year. Yeah. Last week of the quarter, he'd fly out, we'd drive around. <laughs> And he was magical in front of executives better than, yeah. But then there's the desperate people that may not under, especially, you know, when you're covering, like I was covering a lot of the federal government and this was department of Homeland security. So you got the government, you got resellers, you've got uh, us, you've got, you know, all kinds of people involved. We have contract issues. We have funding issues. And they don't understand any of that. And I barely understood it. You know, and each, each day it was a new adventure. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so you have to give it visibility to the extent that you need help and input from the company. But you also, if you give too much exposure, you, you're, jeopard, you're spending half the time explaining where it is. And, it, and the likelihood of something going wrong with it is very high. It's a, uh, it's a really, um, it's a really unique relationship when you develop a level of trust with the leader directly above you, where you can have those communications and you only end up with the planes that you want, yeah. you only end up with the planes when you ask for them versus telling someone, communicating with them and having them bring planes in that just cause chaos. Very, very difficult. Right. Because you don't want to have to spend a lot of time managing the internal system. Yeah, I got, I get you. You know, I, so tell me, what else would you say? That was a good one. I, I think that that was a good one. What else would people want to know or, or hear? Or I, I think they want to know what sales leadership wants out of a rep. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, I can answer, I, I have to answer that question in two parts. The first part is, 
You know, very often sales leaders don't recognize their role. So I'm a very big believer that yes, a sales rep is responsible for 50% of their pipeline, their cold calling, their development. I'm gonna be a slightly, I hope this is a bit controversial because I, I press every leader that I report to about this. Half of all the work that's going on is the responsibility of the rep and the team on the ground. But I also believe that the sales leader has a responsibility to produce market development, sales strategy, relationships, contacts. So I own and I'm very accountable for driving half of my region. I call that corporate. So I represent corporate and all things corporate. We owe my team half of their pipeline, half of their content, half of their material, and they owe it back. So what I expect out of my reps, I expect them to work within the context of, of, of that model, and I expect them to, to be open and honest with me and put in a good day's work. So work ethic and honesty are the two things that matter to me most. But those only work if I also put in a work ethic and produce the things that I need. And one of the mistakes that I see in just about every company that I've worked at at various degrees is up, brains down and says, thou shalt do this and you're responsible and I want, you know, X pipeline and all these things and do all that stuff. But there's a, there's a failure to, to understand that half of this job comes from the company. It's the company's responsibility to provide me, you know, brand, high level marketing, regional coverage, you know, partnering, integration, education. Like when you really look at a sales strategy, and where I've been most successful, it's where I can point down and look at my reps and go, I've got a good team, they understand their job, they've got a good work ethic, you know, we've got, and then I turn to the other side and go, you know what, we've got good technology, we've got good resources, we've got good marketing, people are doing, that's the recipe for up, utmost success. But when you have it, only one of those two things working, breaks down. That's what I've always tried to explain what sales leadership is about. And that's what reps want. Reps want sales leadership to create the environment that works for them. Not just, okay, you figure out how to make it work. It's not changing. Yeah. That, uh, that uh, you know, I had someone recently say to me, look, I, I just sold this. I sold this technology 20 years ago and it doesn't matter. And you could just sell and then, you know, that whole conversation. I'm like, you know, honestly, you know, you're talking to the wrong guy because I'm a professional salesperson. The reality is what you're telling me is you don't have a strategy. You're not sure what you need to do and you're not sure how to help me. So therefore you're telling the field to figure it out on their own. That's okay. But just, let's just admit what we're saying to each other. That's a tough conversation up and people don't like that. But I think that, that, you know, that's one of the things when reps see me defending them in that manner at a regional level and, 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 you know, poking upwards and asking and challenging and doing those types of things, it creates trust. And it also, I think, creates trust from the leadership up. Please don't tell me those things because I'm not going to buy that. What I need from you is, is reality. I need facts. I need details. I need to know exactly what you're going to bring to the table because whatever you bring to the table, I'm going to go then marry that with my field level strategy and make hay. But when, you know, in the absence, I, I, I just find that very challenging sometimes. And you can tell, you and I both know, we've been doing this a long time. When you, when you get someone who's absence of strategy, right? It's, it's obvious in the first five minutes. Yeah. And, and then the reps feel like they're playing a game instead of selling. Creates chaos. Creates chaos. So they, they, they create the 300% pipeline that corporate wants. It's all BS. And then and everyone the starts managing for, phony stuff. Oh. The amount of FUD that happens and, and, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt, like it just, it, it creates a really significant, so I, I, you know, I, I tell my team and I tell my managers and my leaders, I've been doing this a long time. If you're going to bring, you know, baloney to the table, don't bother because I'm guaranteed I'm going to challenge you on it and see right through it. So let's just have an open conversation. And I do it in both directions. I hold my leadership equally as accountable for these types of things. And when they start talking to me about other stuff, I'm like, hey, wait, I mean, like, let's be honest with each other. What you're telling me right now is not relevant. And, you know, and I think downward the same thing. So, you know, I, I'd like to think my team likes working with me because I'm just, I don't 
dilly dally with that stuff and don't come to the table with excuses or other stuff. Just tell me what it is and we'll work on it together and figure it out. Yeah. Cause it's just a waste of time. Cool. Hey, this has been a fun conversation, Sean, where can people go to follow you? Uh, I'm on Instagram, Sean, uh, Sean Cruz, Sean W. Cruz on Instagram. I, I'm uh, on LinkedIn. I don't do a ton of social or other things. I, I spend most of my time working with my team and other, I like doing these things because I, I do like sharing and talking to other uh, qualified and highly experienced salespeople. So I appreciate the time that you've given me. I would say LinkedIn would be the best one. Sean Cruz, uh, RSA Canada right now. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm happy to, you know, listen or hear or have people communicate with me, always willing to help fellow salespeople.